Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you are having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. Today is part two of the Jennifer Rosenbaum case. What an amazing response to part one. You don't know how much that melts my heart that it went over so well. If you haven't seen part one, go ahead and check that one out. I'll link it below and up in the eye. Pause this one, come back. Just to recap here, not a long recap. I just want to play just a bit of the 911 call just to get us where we are right now. What's going on there? 788 radio code one. I have a toddler, a foster daughter that I just got. She was choking, and I tried to do the Heimlich on her. And she's still breathing, but it doesn't work. She's two years old. <laughs> yes, she, is she is breathing now. She is breathing. I'm trying to do CPR. She keeps on. I'm hoping I didn't break her rib. I've been pushing hard. I don't really know how to do this. Okay, I'm going to give you instructions on how to do it. Is she still choking on it now? November 17th. 2015. This date was Jennifer Rosenbaum's 27th birthday. Also, Layla Daniels' last day on earth. Jennifer called 911 for her foster child, Layla, to tell them she was choking on a piece of chicken and that she was concerned her life-saving efforts would break a rib or hurt the child. And likely she started to panic when she realized that the emergency personnel would see her body covered in bruises. When the emergency personnel showed up, Layla not only was not breathing or had a pulse, which means she was clinically deceased when they arrived. They started all in any life-saving measures that they possibly could. Her temperature was still warm when they arrived. As they understood it, they were there for a choking patient. So they were trying to clear her airway. They turned her over, gave her five back blows, and then turned her back over. He then noticed a significant amount of bruising on her back, all the way from her diaper, all the way to her neck. The first responder asked her what Layla's medical history was, and Jennifer would say, oh, I don't know. Oh, the fo it's, she's a foster child. I just don't know what medical issues she had. She said just enough to make that medical responder believe that she was not responsible for Layla's bruising, and it worked. He believed Layla was lucky to have gotten out of a bad situation to be placed in a middle-class home with an educated and caring foster mother. Why would he think otherwise? He had no idea she turned out to be a complete monster. Captain Gibson assumed the extensive bruising had been related to a recent trauma that she had sustained and that's why she was placed with Jennifer, not realizing that Layla had lived with the Rosenbaums for four months at this time. Under normal circumstances, they would have called the time of death on scene, but given her age, only two years old, they started to perform extraordinary life-saving measures in a desperate attempt to save her life. The medical responder was concerned her arm might have been broken. He asked Jennifer if her arm was broken and was seeing if it had movement when he moved it around. It didn't because it was healing, but it was healing in a bowed shape that was very noticeable to the eye. In his testimony, he didn't seem to answer the question if Jennifer ever gave him a response when he asked Jennifer about it. The EMTs left with Layla, then Jennifer called Joseph, her husband, at work and told Told him to meet her and Millie at the hospital because Layla had choked on a piece of chicken. She called the defects caseworker Samantha White to notify her to notify her that Layla has been taken to the hospital by ambulance. Samantha White, after checking with her supervisor, then headed to the hospital. Samantha said Jennifer started once again that Layla had choked on a piece of chicken and stopped breathing, and she couldn't get it dislodged from her throat. Once Samantha arrived at the hospital, she and Jennifer were placed in a separate room. Joseph hadn't arrived to the hospital yet, so the doctor came in and pulled Samantha out of the room and informed 
Samantha, the caseworker, that Layla had passed away. Samantha went back in the room and told Jennifer that Layla had passed away and was covered in bruises. Jennifer didn't say anything. She just cried, according to Samantha's testimony. ER doctors were shocked by the condition of Layla's battered and bruised body, so they actually called in the law enforcement, the police. Layla was clearly in bad shape with severe bruising without even even seeing the internal damage that had been done. She also had two black eyes, an injury on both sides of her face, including her ear, various stages of healing, what looked like an open hand slap to her face. She was missing the skin on one of the back of her ears. Jennifer acted shocked by the news of Layla's condition of bruised and battered body, and she failed to give an adequate explanation of how and why Layla was in that condition. After a while, Jennifer probably, you know, thought about it and she's thinking I have to come up with a story. So she told Samantha White that she had she had patted Layla's back a couple of times to save her life and it was life-saving measures that would explain why there was so many injuries to Layla. This of course being a wrongful death of Layla Daniel, Samantha White was still uncertain of many facts surrounding the murder while she was testifying. The one job that Samantha had to do, she couldn't even give it a second thought to remember. She continuously minimized Millie's injuries, referring to, to them as small bruises or marks. But the prosecution would refresh her memory by showing a picture of extensive bruising and injuries to Millie's body during the trial, which showed way more than a mark. Back at the hospital, they quickly took Millie from Jennifer and placed her into a private room with the caseworker, Samantha White, so they could examine her. She had bruising on her upper back, her thighs, and between her legs. She insisted that she fell and hurt herself at gymnastics, like she was repeatedly told to tell to people by Jennifer. The nurse asked Millie if anything else hurt. Then she mentioned that her elbow is a little bit sore. Later, they would confirm that Millie had had an untreated broken arm, which was sustained at least 10 to 14 days prior. Also, they found 15 additional bruises to her head, back of her legs, all in various stages of healing. Jennifer explained that the bruising between her legs was from her falling off of her bike. Millie was immediately taken into custody and placed back into the care of Patricia Lambert. We talked about Patricia. She's an amazing woman. Just a few days later, after after she was, Layla was sure that she would never have to see the Rosenbaum's house again, she began to open up to Miss, Mrs. Lambert. Millie stated to police during her interview, she overheard a conversation between Jennifer and Mr. Joseph discussing a plan to kill Layla. Law enforcement eventually pieced together as much of the story as they could. They believe what Millie actually heard was Jennifer and Joseph fighting over the the abuse of Layla. It's believed that Joseph was saying to her, you need to stop abusing Layla because you are going to accidentally kill her. Joseph was said to put on cream on their injuries. When they conducted a search warrant, they would find a pain relieving ointment, thus again proving that Joseph knew what was going on. How could someone stand by and do absolutely nothing. Was he as sick as Jennifer and got enjoyment out of it? Let's hope that is not the case. My brain just cannot compute why he didn't hurt the girls, but watch Jennifer do it. It just doesn't register. When Jennifer called 911, Jennifer most likely already knew that Layla was dead. Why it's believed that she knew is because on the way to the hospital, Jennifer told Millie that Layla had died from choking on a piece of chicken, only confirming she already knew. Millie, at her own pace, started to tell the tales 
of what actually happened while they were in the care of Jennifer. She recounts her and Layla being dragged up and down the stairs by their arms. In a rage, Jennifer would also twist their arms when she was mad at them. She would also state that Jennifer was the only person that physically disciplined them. Joseph would stand by and do nothing. He would just watch the beating and torture and never trying to defend the girls who had no one to protect them. Millie and Layla would take too long getting dressed after their baths. They were taken into Jennifer's room, bent over her bed, and beaten with a leather belt. Both of them still had loop-shaped bruises on their back, bottom, inner thighs when they were inspected after Layla's death. Millie would also say that if they moved too slowly, Jennifer would kick them between their legs. How does someone kick a two-year-old between the legs because they didn't move fast enough? Could you even imagine? If they fell asleep in the car, like most kids do, they were punished, sometimes with a belt and sometimes with her hand. Jennifer had a very strict schedule, and if her schedule was delayed for any reason, there would be extreme punishments given to the girls. Her expectation for the girls was something that was unrealistic. She wanted to control every aspect of their behavior. Being in their already fragile emotional state of neglect makes her expectations even more out of reality. Jennifer didn't see the girls as people. She's seen them as props in her facade. This was proven when Jennifer threw Layla a birthday party when Millie and Layla first moved in with Jennifer. Layla was turning two years old and Jennifer invited all of her prominent co-workers and friends to show the girls off. She did invite the girls' family as well. The great-grandmother was there and recalls that Millie was standoffish towards her, which was never the case before. She asked Millie to come sit on her lap. Millie told her that she could not do that. The great-grandmother asked, why not? And Millie replied, Jennifer said, I couldn't. This is also believed to be a message to the family that they are going to be phased out as much as Jennifer possibly could. Millie loved her grandmother and her being the only few people that she actually knew at the party, this didn't make sense. The great grandmother concerned and probably heartbroken called Jennifer out on it and asked her what was going on. Jennifer would say that her friends and family had driven so far to to be there and she wanted to make sure that the girls were meeting all new people and not spending all their time with them. But we can all guess this was a control strategy and her attempt to show she was the mother now and couldn't let her friends see the girls had affection towards their old family. This was most likely another attempt to further her political career as well. Millie was also told that if she said anything about her spankings or abuse, that she would be punished twice is bad. As it was mentioned before, it looked to outsiders as if Jennifer singled out Layla. She would sustain the most punishments by Jennifer. Because Layla couldn't ask anyone for help, it was most likely she didn't compute that Jennifer was dangerous. Millie could understand that Jennifer was a real threat and needed to do exactly what she said. Two-year-olds are exploring their independence and don't have the wherewithal to be compliant. Client. Terrible twos, which I always thought was three, but at that age, two is a challenge. But still, you know, Jennifer had these expectations. Jennifer demanded order and full control, something a two-year-old would not be able to understand. And especially because, remember, these children had been moved around so much. Order, in my opinion, would be so foreign to them. It is believed the reason that Layla received the brunt of the abuse as well was because she was nonverbal. She couldn't tell her elders about abuse, as Millie could. As Millie was away from the Rosenbaums and she felt safer, the more she felt comfortable telling others about what was really happening in Jennifer's dungeon of hell, she started to talk to Mrs. Lambert, then she was able to talk to her great-grandmother, Peggy Banks, about the things that had happened as well. At the hospital, still 
in the waiting room the day that Layla died, Jennifer became stoic and would explain this was because she just couldn't cry anymore. I imagine fake crying is hard to do for a long period of time. Joseph was said to be very emotional and openly weeping. While all these emotions are high, Jennifer still doesn't break trying to control the narrative. She kept insisting that the life-saving measures were the cause of Layla's injuries. Joseph never corrected her or told the staff anything. He was a fly on the wall as he always had been. Jennifer then asked if she could regain custody of Millie. She was in panic mode. She would say that she was concerned about Millie and she would be safer with her, as she always claimed throughout. She needed to make sure Millie wouldn't tell anybody about what was happening in her home, and the only way to do that is to regain control. Her web of lies was unfolding. Jennifer continues blaming old foster homes and the family for the condition of Layla's body. The problem with that explanation is that Jennifer had slowly but surely been cutting the children off from their family, so their visits were far and few between. Also, if this was the case and Jennifer was innocent, wouldn't she report bruises and everything that was going on when they returned from the family. She would go on to say it was the Heimlich maneuver as well as the force to which she performed CPR. She would explain that she didn't really know what she was doing, so most likely it was wrong and therefore causing excessive injuries. Additionally, the paramedics did life-saving measures as well as when Layla arrived at the ER, they worked on her for another 30 minutes. This continued to be her excuse to investigators, but that couldn't explain how Layla had lost so much weight in her care. She, in fact, was underweight. Look at these comparison photos of Layla. One she is just before she was with the Rosenbaums, and she's plump, she's beautiful, she's healthy, and then in their care, she's thin, dark-circled eyes. Jennifer's prominence in the community with political aspirations and affiliations with the Henry County District Attorney's Office, Henry County had to recuse themselves from the investigation or even prosecuting the Rosenbaum's case. It was transferred over to the neighboring DeKalb County. The county was most concerned that members of the DA's office had gone out of their way to help Jennifer gain custody of the children and that their actions might constitute a conflict of interest and could show political bias. Still in the hospital as Layla is pronounced dead, she was recognized in the ER as a prominent political candidate by the county coroner, Donald Cleveland. Donald watched the public broadcast of the county meetings, which he seen Jennifer in attendance. You know, it's very tacky, it's very unprofessional, and bullying tactics are not the way to get to your citizens. A screenshot of the person who it was, and I'm um, more than happy to put that out on so social media or take that to the news outlet. What's your name and uh, address for record, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jennifer Rosenbaum. My address is 1521 Lincoln Terrace, McDonough, Georgia, 30252. Is the microphone on? I'm sorry. Is it? Okay, there we, we go. Hey, we do now. Can my time start over? <laughs> yes. yes. It's 1521 Lincoln Terrace, McDonough, Georgia, 30252. That's in District 1. Good. Um, gentlemen, tonight I'm here because I want to voice my concerns for uh, this proposed increase and this. Um, Pretty much all, I'm assuming, um, despite Mr. Holmes, ran and voiced their campaign on conservative values um, and values that your constituency appreciated and obviously liked well enough to vote for you. And these people, I'm assuming most of you thought, were smart enough to be able to put you in office, but now their ideas maybe are not so smart that you're willing to put your vote on them. And I am here today to ask, to challenge you to do so. Um, Mr. Commissioner Moss, this is specifically for you since, you know, you directly represent myself as well as you, Chairman Smith, uh, for representing the county. But I actually challenge all of the commissioners 
to look at what the people are coming here, what they're saying, how are they feeling about this. I have a couple of proposals, and I'm not even a commissioner, about uh, things that we could do besides putting the burden. And it was clear he knew exactly who she was. He would say that he would applaud Jennifer for her appearances at the public county meetings, saying she was a young woman tackling the county. Samantha White, just in case you thought I wasn't going to talk about the defects worker, Samantha White again. Let's talk about her. She was immediately fired and she was personally sued. Also, defects was sued. I am not sure what that settlement was or what turned out with that. Tamara Werner, the supervisor of Samantha at defects, was also fired. A couple of weeks later, both Jennifer and Joseph were arrested. The arrest affidavit stated that Layla was starved and beaten for months until she ultimately died from blunt force trauma. She was either hit with a fist or kicked to the abdomen with such force that it lacerated her liver. This injury was new from the earlier laceration as we talked about in part one. The earlier liver injury was already in later stages of healing. With this new liver injury though, Layla ultimately died from blood loss from a transsexual pancreas, which had ripped into two separate parts. Jennifer was charged with murder and aggravated assault, child cruelty in the second degree, with two counts of child cruelty in the first degree. Joseph was charged with two counts of child cruelty, but after the autopsy was completed, prosecutors upgraded the charges against both of them to 49 separate counts, including malice, murder, and torture. The defense attorney believes that the prosecuting office was overcharging Joseph in hopes that he would cut a deal and testify against Jennifer. Which, if he had a spine at all, he would have, but he never did. He's just as much of a monster as Jennifer. This was his one chance to step up and do the right thing, but he didn't. I thought maybe Jennifer was controlling him as well, but once they were separated in their own jails, he still didn't, He, you know, he had time to think. He still didn't choose to do the right thing. The defense would also claim Jennifer was only charged because of a political vendetta against her Republican vocal criticism of local government, which is BS. The Rosenbaum trial began in July of 2019 in DeKalb County, Georgia. Jennifer was no longer seen as a savior in the public's eye. Rather, she was finally unmasked as the true monster that she so conveniently hidden behind. Her facade of caring and kindness, the trial would also reveal that repeated failures in apathy of the very individuals who their primary job was to protect the children. Remember all the mandatory reporters who said nothing, the caseworker whose only job was to make sure the girls were safe, they were all revealed throughout the trial and only adds frustration to the short life of Layla. It's so senseless and it could have been avoided. Prosecutor Young's opening statement, she describes the Rosenbaums as, quote, liars, abusers, and murderers. Jennifer saw herself as a saint of her own time and energy to benefit that of others. Everything that came out of her mouth was a lie. She lied about the children attending counseling. She lied about them attending daycare. Also lied about how the children received their injuries. Young looks at Jennifer, you lied about everything and to everyone except for Joseph. Joseph knew and saw the truth firsthand. He got a front row seat of the evilness and sat as a silent witness watching the torture and abuse of the two innocent girls. Meanwhile, standing by doing nothing to stop it, making him just as guilty as Jennifer in its entirety. The defense was trying to prove that the injuries were due to life-saving measures that they had to perform and they intended on proving 
just that. Millie, the surviving sister, had injuries that would have something different to say as well as her literal words. Although the defense would try to say that Millie's testimony was influenced by her family instead of the truth, they would claim that Millie was a liar. Defense attorneys had a job, but in this case, how did they sleep at night? This is the type of case that you call in sick for when it comes to the defense. Millie would go on to be adopted when she was six years old, along with her additional two sisters Tessa had along the way. She testified when she was seven, just for reference. Her new foster mother, Amanda, would say, well, I'll just play it for you, you guys, and you can hear firsthand from Amanda. State and spell your name. Amanda Harrell. And Miss Harrell, how do you know Millie Harrell? She's my daughter. And how did she come to be your daughter? Um, I became a foster parent um, in August of 15 and through the course of the time um, her younger sisters were placed with me and then a little bit more time came then we were blessed to have her come with us. Why did you become a foster parent? Um, it just kind of presented itself. I had learned um, through a friend more about fostering and um, I was married. I didn't have any kids. Um, and the more I thought about it, I had a loving home to offer and I had a flexible job that gave me a, you know, the freedom to be able to provide what was needed. And then it just kind of took off from there. And before um, Millie's younger sisters, how many foster children did you have? None. They were your first? My first and only. Now, how old was Millie when she first came to live with you? Six. Six. And how old was Millie's younger sisters when they came to live with you? Um, Carly was um, just shy of a month, and Hannah was seven weeks, I believe. When was the first time you met Millie? I had met Millie, I don't remember ever seeing her at any court hearings, but I believe the first time I ever met her was when a, our transporter for visitations um, a few times due to scheduling changes, she would pick Millie up before she would come to get Carly. And I had the opportunity just to briefly meet her in the backseat of the car as I was buckling Carly. When you say um, visitations, what kind of visitations were taking place? Um, the girls had um, visitations with um, either Tessa, you know, or the sisters. You know, eventually we got to where we had, you know, sibling visits and um, a transporter would pick up uh, Carly for me and then take her to wherever the visits were taking place. And was the transporter someone employed by DFAX? Um, I think it was it was an outside company that DFAX employs to do their transporting and I think they do home studies and stuff as well. How did you learn of Layla's death? The night that Layla died I received a call. Um, I believe it was from a caseworker from Henry County or someone from DFAX um, requesting the number to my foster agency's uh, emergency intake line. Um, during that call, they did say that um, Carly's sister, you know, had tragically passed away and that they were looking for possibly emergency placements of Millie. Um, they asked if I would take her and I said yes. Um, and then that was the end of it. Yeah. At the time of that phone call, had you met Millie those few times with the transporter? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. No, I had not. No. Okay. So at the time of that phone call, you had not met Millie no. at all? No. Carly had only been with me maybe five weeks. So what happened between the phone call you got on November 17, 2015, asking you if you would take Millie, and July 2017? I asked that a lot, too. Um, when I agreed, it was obviously things were chaos. It was late at night. Um, I didn't hear back from them. Um, and so, of course, I am frantically trying to figure out what's about to happen and am I now going to, you know, am I making changes for, you know, room for a four-year-old? Um, and as I waited and waited and I, things kind of changed and then all of a sudden DFAX came back and had a concern because I had a pool, I had dogs, and um, they wanted those things addressed. So by, you know, then my dogs were cleared and everything was fine and then I had to add an additional fence to the pool, and by the time I was able to get that taken care of, uh, Millie had already been placed in another home, so they said 
she's going to stay where she is. Now, how often um, have you and Millie talked about the death of her sister Layla, as well as Millie's experiences at the Rosenbaums? Um, very rarely. It's definitely something that she does not want to talk about. I don't push the issue. Uh, we talk about Layla all the time, we, um, but we just don't talk about her experiences. When you talk about Layla, what kind of things are you talking about? Um, talk, she'll tell me about things that Layla liked to do, you know, what she was like, and, um, you know, she'll just, like, you know, tell stories of they would read, you know, she would read a book, you know, to Layla, those kind of things. Now, has Millie ever told you anything about what happened to her while living at the Rosenbaum's? Um, she has made um, a couple brief statements, um, you know, throughout the course of our time together. Now, how would these statements begin? How would they come up? Very, very random. Um, you know, looking back, I still can't ever think about how it would come up. We may just be in the car and she would just make a statement. Um, or we might be talking about something, you know, that we want for dinner and then she'll go into why she doesn't want something. Um, but then she makes a statement and moves on. Have you ever asked her directly about what happened at the Rosenbaum's? No. And when Millie would make these statements, would you ask her questions? No. What exactly has Millie told you about what happened to her at the Rosenbaum's? She's, um, I think, mentioned four different things that had happened. Um, one of them being that um, she and Layla would get in trouble if they fell asleep in the car and they would receive spankings if they, um, they would get in trouble and or receive spankings if they ever fell asleep in the car. Did she tell you anything else? She said um, at one time she wasn't doing something fast enough, so Jennifer twisted her ankle and sat on her. And when she told you this, did you ask her any more questions? I didn't because I don't, I have no information as to what happened and I, I mean, never having, you know, a child this age, especially a child of trauma, I didn't want to ever make it worse. I didn't want to make her talk about something because when she would make these statements, it was a one and done. She would say it and before she could finish that sentence, she had already changed the subject and it was clear she did not want to talk about it. And what was the the fourth thing that she told you about being okay, the uh, thinkings, um, but she had said um, at one point she um, that she was forced to eat mashed potatoes until she vomited and then was forced to eat the vomit. And how did that statement come up? Um, we were talking about things, um, always trying to come up with different things to have for dinner. Um, it becomes challenging that you have three kids that will eat. Um, so I'm always trying to get them to tell me things that they like, because if they tell me they like it, then they can't sit at the table and tell me they don't. And so we talked about potatoes and, you know, does she like potatoes of any kind? And she said, no. Amanda, from her testimony, didn't seem like she was force feeding information to Millie to say, in my opinion. The defense's most damning witness was the medical examiner, Dr. Darasa, who was with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, who conducted Layla's forensic autopsy and testified of ongoing torture and abuse. 22 injuries to her head and neck, with 11 additional injuries to her torso, and multiple injuries noted to to her legs as well as three broken bones. They were with Jennifer for four months. An untreated broken rib, an untreated broken arm, and had a broken leg. Let's hear from the medical examiner herself. What I observed and what she described, um, I would say would not be what I expect or commonly see when someone has an event where their airway is blocked by a foreign object. This, the ideal of choking may be a word that is confused with actually airway obstruction by a foreign body. Um, so what I observe is a description of um, the child having choking was the word used, but in the description she describes that the child's head kind of moved back, her arms were moving, her legs were moving, and her whole body was kind of moving such that it was a little bit distracting to her. And that's a description of actually a seizure. I mean, we know that when we're talking about arms moving, legs moving, the whole body shaking, 
Um, the word seizure was not used by her, but that's a description of a seizure. So this appeared to me to be a child that was having a seizure that um, was then, you know, with her head moving back at one point in time, there is a description of her eyes rolling back in her head. And again, these are all features of a seizure and not of a foreign body obstruction of the airway, coughing and trying to free a foreign body in the airway. Now, when, when I hear seizure, I think of something like epilepsy. Um, is that the only thing that can cause a seizure or seizure-like seizure -like, um, activity? Well, epilepsy is an actual natural disease process where one has seizures um, on a regular basis uh, through life. But also, at the time of death, depending on what the circumstances are, you have terminal seizures. Terminal seizures are quite frequent with head trauma. They're quite frequent with various types of trauma where you have blood loss. And so as you have blood loss, your body is starting to go into shock um, because blood is not flowing in the vessels supplying oxygen to all your organs, but your body is going to shock. You're losing blood. And those are the type of things that cause these seizures as one is dying. Um, and so the whole scenario and events that I have reviewed are a description of a child that is going into shock as opposed to as a child that has a foreign object such as food. In this particular case, the um, suggestion was that she had choked on chicken. Um, the description is not consistent with that at all. She would say that the fatal blows to Layla's abdomen was most likely happened an hour before the 911 call. Additionally, would say that she likely was already dead at the time of the 911 call. Jennifer explained away all 22 of, of the head injuries as being caused by Layla jumping on bunk beds and striking her head repeatedly on the upper bunk, causing all 22 bruises and abrasions to her scalp. Dr. Arthur explained the amount and location of bruises would make that impossible, especially the bruises to both ears and both sides of her face, which were more consistent with abuse. While all injuries were concerning, the fatal injury came as a result of blood loss from blunt force trauma. She did not believe that any of the CPR effort could have contributed to Layla's injuries. She was likely already dead when the paramedics arrived, and dead bodies cannot actively bleed or bruise. The autopsy found over 15% of Layla's entire blood volume in her stomach cavity, which was inconsistent with life. She would also testify that the broken rib in Layla's back was over 10 days old and could not have been a result of Jennifer incorrectly performing the Heimlich maneuver. The medical examiner explains some of the bruising and the broken rib were greater than 10 days old. If so, it, it is possible that Samantha would have seen signs of abuse if she would have actually done her job and checked them over because remember, she was there just 15 days before Layla was dead. At Layla's age, ribs are very pliable and bendable. So therefore, it would be excessive, extreme pressure to squeeze her diaphragm to fracture a rib at only two years old. Also had an older healing lacerated liver, as we talked about in the newer laceration that happened probably an hour before the 911 call. The medical examiner compared it to blunt force trauma from a car accident. That's what it looked like. Almost four years had passed between the time of Layla's death and the Rosenbaum's joint trial. In those years, Layla's mother, Tessa, had given birth to two more children, one in late 2015 and another in October of 2016. Not sure if she had another one. I heard that she possibly did. I'm not sure. Initially, Peggy Banks, the great-grandmother, fought hard to adopt Millie. She was able to get a waiver from her age-restricted apartment uh, retirement community, allowing Millie to reside in her home for up to two years. Eventually, she realized that the best thing for Millie would be for her to live with her two sisters in the same home. Millie, seven years old when she would testify, had forgotten many of the details surrounding her time 
with the Rosenbaums, but there were a few memories she would never forget while in the home of Jennifer and Joseph. Here is the heartbreaking testimony of Millie. <laughs> Yes. Um, what's your name? Millie. And how do you spell Millie? M I L L I E. How old are you, Millie? Seven. Millie, do you know why you're here today? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and why are you here today? To talk about stuff. <laughs> to talk about stuff? Okay. What stuff are you here to talk about? Let me ask you another one. Was there a time that you lived with Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum? Yes. Okay. When you lived with Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum, did anyone else live with you? Layla. Who's Layla? My sister. When you lived with Jennifer Rosenbaum, what did you call what did you call Jennifer Rosenbaum? Miss Jennifer. Miss Jennifer? And when you lived with Joseph Rosenbaum, what did you call Joseph? Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Amen. Thank you. Millie, I'm going to show you this picture. It has a sticker on it. It says States Exhibit 105. Do you know what that's a picture of? The house. And what is on the, when you say the house, what house are you talking about? The house that I used to live in. And who lived in that house with you? Layla. And who else lived in that house? Jennifer and Joseph. And now I'm going to show you States Exhibit 6. And do you recognize the picture? Yes. And how do you recognize it? It's the, it's the door. The door of what? The house. The house? Okay. And what house was that? The house that we used to live in. And you say used to live in. Who did you live? Who lived in the house? Jennifer, me, Layla, and Joseph. When you lived with Joseph and Jennifer, was there anything you liked about it? Yes. And what did you like? Um, that the front door was red. Front door was red? Okay. Was there anything else you liked? No. Um, was there, when you lived with Joseph and Jennifer, was there anything you didn't like? Yes. Um, what are some of the things you didn't like? That the bathroom was really small. The bathroom was really small? And did you ever have a party at Noah's Ark? Yes. Did you like the party? Yes. What was the party for? My fifth birthday? Your fifth birthday? Could it have been your fourth birthday? Yeah. Yes. Now, when you were living with Joseph and Jennifer, um, would you take a bath, a shower, or something else? A bath. A bath. And when you took a bath, did you take it with Layla or by yourself? With Layla. And would someone be in the bathroom to help Layla take her bath? Yes. Okay. Would Jennifer help you and Layla take baths? Yes. Um, would Joseph ever help with the baths? He helped with Layla's baths. He helped with Layla's bath. And how come you didn't help with your bath? I don't know. Could you do your own bath? Yes. Um, how about, could you dress yourself when you were living with Jennifer and Joseph? Yes. What about Layla? Could she dress herself? No. Um, if Layla couldn't dress herself, um, who would help Layla dress herself? Jennifer. Would Joseph ever help Layla dress herself? Yes. Throughout the trial, Jennifer and Joseph sat in the same position, in the same seats at the defense table. The day Millie testified, they switched seats. This is 
so disgusting. It it literally is disgusting. I was completely shocked. After what I already knew about Jennifer, I am not sure why I was so shocked, but Jennifer always hid her evil. But this day, you saw exactly what type of person she was. Jennifer moved to the end of the table where she could see directly at Millie while Millie testified. In her original seat, Jennifer was blocked from the witness stand by a podium. Millie would be in direct eyesight with Jennifer throughout out her testimony. And when her questions were asked about the abuse, Millie would look at Jennifer immediately and lose her train of thought. Clearly a defense strategy, especially because right after Millie's done testifying, they move back to their original seats and they remained that way for the rest of the trial. It's just gross, and I'm sure it was clear to the jury what she was doing. Look at Jennifer's eyes in these pictures. It is surprising how dead her eyes look. Is it just me? The defense later asked the judge for a directed verdict to Joseph Rosenbaum, which is a procedure where the judge decides on the spot if the evidence was inadequate to go to, to trial in a jury. However, the prosecution was able to use Millie's testimony to establish that Joseph had to have been aware of the ongoing abuse of the girls. There is no way in my mind he was not aware of what was going on. He was there during bath time seeing their injury while they were undressing for their bath, there would be bruises and it wouldn't be hidden by clothing at that time. He would have heard when Jennifer was punishing the girls as well. Millie did not want to answer and kept looking over to Jennifer during her testimony. The prosecutor would gently remind Millie to look back at her. When the prosecutor was able to position herself slightly to block Millie's line of sight to and from Jennifer and she couldn't see her anymore, she was able to answer the questions without intimidation. Isn't that gross? I'm just, I'm just like so surprised. I don't know why, but anyways. The defense cross-examined Millie for almost 40 minutes, showing numerous photos of her and Layla while they lived at the Rosenbaums. The defense would ask her if she had fun or was having a good time for each photo. The purpose was to get Millie to remember the happy times while she lived in the home with the Rosenbaums. This tactic actually was having an opposite effect. Millie's trembling voice indicated that there was anything but happy times. Jennifer probably remembers them as happy times, but not Millie. The defense also tries to establish that some of the injuries to Layla's head had been inflicted by Layla herself hitting her head on the ledge of the bunk beds. Tactics again seemed to backfire. Millie increasingly became withdrawn and stated that she couldn't recall many of the events. It was stated that it was outrageously cruel for the defense counsel to repeatedly show pictures after picture of Layla at petting zoos, at festivals, at birthday parties, or having their, their faces painted. Certainly didn't elicit any evidentiary value, nor did it do anything to exonerate Jennifer or Joseph. The defense had no regard to the emotional state of Millie. It was just cruel. The defense called a series of witnesses who were close friends and supporters of the Rosenbaums, each insisting that Jennifer and Joseph loved those girls, claiming Jennifer and Joseph were the real victims of a corrupt political vendetta. When these witnesses were later shown pictures of Layla and Millie's battered bruised bodies in the court, they were shocked. One of the witnesses even cried and said she no longer supported or believed Jennifer. Joseph's mother, Mary Rosenbaum, was also shown photos of Layla at the time of her death and became extremely emotional. She appeared surprised by the photos of Millie's bruised body to her neck and back area. Until that day in court, she was unaware that the 
abuse was happening to Millie and thought that it was only Layla and most likely believed that Jennifer's lies about it was happening when she was doing CPR or the Heimlich maneuver. But when she seen the abuse to Millie, it really opened up her eyes. The prosecutor who was full of compassion for Layla gave her closing arguments asking the jury for a measure of justice for the senseless torture and tragic murder of Layla Daniel. It was reported that Patricia Lambert worked tirelessly to love, nurture, soothe, and shield dozens of children. For a decade, she fostered children. She even tried to save Layla Daniel from the home that Tessa considered a blessing. Someone who had only fooled Layla's mother, also friends and neighbors, caseworkers, doctors, even attorneys, and a judge. But Jennifer Rosebaum's complete mask was shattered and the true Jennifer came to light. But unfortunately, a senseless death of a beautiful two-year-old girl happened before it was unveiled. The jury convicted Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum on over a dozen of charges. Even though Joseph never actually struck either child, in the eyes of the court, his silence and complacency was equal responsibility. The judge was outraged by the comments by Joseph's family. Joseph's family blaming the death of Layla on her biological mother's addiction, but she alleged was the cause of the girls being placed with the Rosenbaums in the first place, saying it's her fault. They, she should have never been with them. Mary Rosenbaum alleged that in prison, her son would most likely kill himself, and he suffers from a life-threatening fatal disease, but never acknowledges the death, the killing, the murder of Layla. The loss of Layla or a mention of Layla, nothing. This did not impress the judge at all. Here is the judge's statements at sentencing. Let me just also add uh, that it is deeply frustrating for the court to hear family members of the defendants quarrel with the verdict that was rendered in this case. This case was carefully tried. And I'm deeply concerned of the lack of recognition on behalf of the defendant's family, of the scope of the tragedy, and of the cause of the tragedy. I've lived with this case for a long time, too. And I will tell you that it is one of the worst, most horrible crimes and outcomes that anyone could ever experience or dream of experience. And so, I just want to say that I feel for and deeply hanged by your loss. And I hope that you will somehow find a way to recover. Jennifer Rosenbaum was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole plus 40 years. Joseph was given equivalent of a life sentence, receiving 50 years, 30 he has to be in prison, and 20 probation. He most likely will not live to be free again. His life expectancy is half of a, a regular male, so we'll see what happens. Layla Daniel was buried at the expense of the county. For two years, there was nothing more than an extended patch of dirt until two former police officers took it upon themselves to install a 120 pound stone marker with a custom carving of a little girl on her knees in prayer with the words that read, in God's care. 
Rest in peace, Layla Daniel. This has been a long one. I really wanted to give this case the attention it deserves, the attention Layla deserves, and raise awareness of our systemic issues within DFACS or CPS or any of those types of agencies. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Again, thanks so much for your support on my videos. It means the world to me. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Captured Killers playlist for you to check out. But either way, stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.